Hi, um, I'm Cindy Tondolo, an AB member, um, a Gogo healer, 
uh, a friend and a creative, just like uh, all of us, many of us that have joined us today. Thank you, thank you so much for joining. And before we proceed, please note that um, this discussion platform is part of a series of discussions that we're looking to have, this one being the first, and um, it will be recorded um, because we want to rebroadcast that and share this across um, across our platforms. So if you are, and you, we're, gonna, we're gonna use a recording for future purposes as well. So if you're uncomfortable with us recording um, and you being on and recorded, um, you can step out and just observe whatever and um, you can catch us, you can, you can watch it in your own time on YouTube if you're uncomfortable. Please note that this session will be recorded. All right, so um, let me, today's, dis what, what, is, what are all these discussions about? All right, so we are talking, we are looking in, internally, um, you know, in, in terms of our practices as Africa Burn, and uh, we decided, like, as we're looking and, and we're talking about inclusivity and, and access, and so we looked into, into the industry as a whole, and just thought, let's have a, a series of discussions since our last one, uh, which is gender equity in the arts, was, um, was, was, was really effervescent and, and, and such an important conversation to have. And we thought we'd have a, um, a series of intersection conversations, um, you know, in light of the, this whole, whole public art space and everything. And this particular one is called Holding Up the Mirror, so which is quite a task to do. Um, and that and that really means like a reflect a reflection. So, Africa Burn sits in the landscape of public art, uh, which is all about engagement, conversation, reflection, and transcendence of what is going on around us. And in light of the current situation, uh, we all found ourselves in. We thought it would be wise to use this time when we can't gather to reflect and engage our community on the topic of transformation within the public arts field and looking within ourselves. And um, in that light also, we stand by the, the artists the, across the country who are occupying the NAC at the moment. Um, we, you know, because we all feel let down by what's happening with the NAC and how they're retracting and reneging on their contracts. So the Africa Burn and, and this community, we stand by those artists and we stand by that cause. So yeah, so public art is recognized um, or has the power to mobilize social consciousness, shape new geographies, um, you know, outside of the gallery and white cube space, um, challenge, shape, and expand understanding of contemporary visual practices and conversations. And it can help us rethink and reimagine like historical spaces, you know, social political circumstances, economic and cultural spheres. And, you know, we know that the purpose of, art, of public art is to raise awareness, memorialize, initiate dialogue and entertain, negotiate ideological preoccupations, express the message and propose a pressing agenda or claim or, re or, or, claim or reclaim a public space. And it, it's with this that we're hosting these series. It's, it's with this purpose that we are hosting the series. I think the time is ripe for us to, to engage and be brave enough to talk about the things that are important in our field and to ask ourselves critical questions. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce, um, you know, the panel of speakers that are here today, uh, who will be joining us um, in, 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 this, in this process. Our latest and, uh, and one of our newest um, national executive directors that have just been appointed, Ralph Borland, very excited about this uh, public art practitioner is one of our panelists who will be joining us today. Okay, we've got Kyla Davis and Lerado Selefoshe. Okay, um, as, you, as you know, these incredible people keep, you've seen them in the community, they're waving and peace and air. <laughs> we've got Lorraine Tanner, the, the lady. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. Um, and each of them will introduce himself. And of course, we've got, um, tonight we've got Ms. Monique Shreves. Thank you. Monique, please show yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and lastly, on this particular panel, we've got uh, Roger, Mr. Van Wake, Mr. Van Wake on today. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask each and one of you guys just to tell us who you are, what do you do in the public art space, how you connected with AB in any form or fashion, and what's your passions, your dreams, anything you'd like to, to share with us today to reintroduce or introduce yourself. Please kindly share. 
starting with uh, let's start with Kyla and and Lerato, please. Hi guys, uh, my name is Lerato Sefoloshe. I am an artist based in Johannesburg. And yeah, basically just in the art space and learning more as I grow. Um, and I've been working with Kyla for like three, four years now. And yes, that's how I know Africa Burn. Uh, my name is Kyla Davis. Um, I'm the founder and director of Well Worn Theatre Company. We make ecological justice theatre. We're based in Johannesburg. Um, we've been coming to the Burn since 2013. Uh, we, we have a particular passion for public arts and public performance and masks, puppets, uh, crazy crazy experimental stuff in the desert. Uh, and we, we also believe that um, the kind of arts that we make is uh, it's, we cannot separate it from social justice or from a community building. So our, our art and our ethics are very closely aligned, um, which is why the burn appeals to us because it really is a, an experiment in community building. Um, yeah, that's us. <laughs> Happy thank to be you. on the panel. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mm. And Mr. Ralph Borden, can you please tell, me more, tell us more about yourself? Uh, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a new nerd or non-executive director, and uh, I also started a new job uh, last week uh, at UCT. I'm a researcher with the Institute for Humanities in Africa, Humor, um, and I'm looking at the fourth, the role of the of the human in the fourth industrial revolution in Africa. I'm an artist and a curator. And I have a project called African Robots in which I work with street wire artists making interactive electronic wire art. And um, I, I also went to Africa Burn for the first time in 2013. And in 2014, I made a wind powered musical instrument uh, called a, an Aeolian line. So it's a long line that catches the movement of the wind and makes a, makes a musical uh, installation. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me here. Glad to be here. Um, Lorraine, um, uh, could you also introduce yourself and then Monique? Sure, I'm Lorraine and I am a paper shuffler at Africa Burn and um, I have a particular interest in kind of like street performance and street theatre, beach theatre, carnivals that address um, various social issues about making intercultural spaces and um, environmental education, those kinds of things. So prior to Africa Burn, I was involved in a lot of local arts projects that sought to be inclusive, sought to be accessible, involved a lot of children and kind of um, twinning programs, bringing kids together from different communities. So yeah, that's my interest. And that's why I got involved in Africa Burn because I came to Africa Burn with an intercultural carnival project and we mobilize a whole load of people to sit down on the ground and make an image, an aerial image. So yeah, that's how I got involved in Africa Burn. Monique, it's your turn. Hi. Um... My name is Monique. I um, I'm the current uh, creative lead at Africa Burn. Um, I really, really miss engaging with artists on a daily basis, seeing as we haven't had an event, because that's really where the the amazing alchemy happens for me. But um, I'm also liaison and I do development, and I'm leading the whole land project. Um, um, I'm one of the founders and actually of Africa Burn, but there's an interesting piece of um, trivia is that Ralph Borland, our new NED, was the first person who ever told me about Burning Man uh, back in 2000, many moons back. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, my, 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 my academic training is environmental science and I've, I've worked in land reform. And so, so it's quite a, it's, it's a lovely coming together with this, um, the kind of creative side and the land project at Africa Burn, which is just 
so chock full of potential um, and very exciting, but I am, I grew up in a very creative environment, no, no particular art training um, other than what's happened in the last kind of 20 years of my life, <laughs> which was MCQP and Africa Burn. Um, and I have made um, sculptures at Africa Burn as well, been on large teams and then I kind of manage a lot of the large builds too. Um, and excited to be here. Thank you, Mons. Um, Roger, Mr. Van Wake, please can you um, introduce yourself and followed by, uh, can you give us a piece of wisdom and some context and lead us into our, in, into our discussion series? Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so yes, a little bit about myself. I have a background as an artist and urban planning, landed up working in public art and uh, museum projects. And uh, my friends who were engaged with Africa Burn really drew me into the membership. And I did that willingly to support the creative sector there, which I really felt um, strongly about. I think I've always believed in the power of creativity for change. And, you know, growing up in the 80s, we were very much engaged in cultural activism of all kinds. So that's really, so that's really defined me. Um, and I was also really inspired by the potential of having uh, our own space in the Tankwa, that incredible basin to be able to uh, enrich the experiment that has been started here. So that really inspired me to step up, I must say at the last minute, to be one of the nerds, the non-executive directors, which I took on at the beginning of last year through this very challenging time. Um, but yeah, I'm also brewing with hope for the potentials of what could evolve in this next chapter. So holding up the mirror, reflecting on ourselves, um, I really just want to thank Cindy and, and the team for hosting a discussion of this sort. I really think it's so valuable to our work and what we're doing. And, you know, Cindy has been incredible in driving these kinds of initiatives. And for me, really discussion is at the core of what I think I take away from the burn experience. Um, you know, often when I've, I feel burnout, I'm never going back there again, but it'll be one discussion that I had with one person in some chance encounter, which just keeps that hook in me and keeps the interest going. So I think the discussion is really important. So part of what we're discussing tonight is around how Africa burns is, is seen in the cultural sector and what that means. And it made me think of that book by Sarah Thornton, um, which is very readable as an art book because she's a sociologist and talks about the art world as seven days where each day is a different chapter which deals with completely different things. The art studio, the art auction, um, the art magazine, each of which has completely its own vocabulary, its own values, its own engagement. And uh, <clears throat> Africa Burn in a way, Although it's created this platform and canvas, which is so inclusive of, you know, so many different kinds of creative endeavors, is in a way its own world. Um, and it's curious how, uh, well, maybe not that curious, but it's often, it's often very little discussed in, in cultural media. There have been some serious writers who have tackled the arts aspect of it, but not much. Mostly when people write about it, it's the sort of overwhelming experience that they try to put across to an audience. Um, and it's, I think the seriousness of a lot of the work is often dismissed. So I had the brief experience at Burning Man in 2013, going there with the Flum Collective, which, uh, which is the first and only time I've been there. And I must say, one of the impressions I took away is being very impressed with the degree of content there, that the sexual revolution and the psychological and the psychedelic revolution are really, you know, there's that uh, there's that long continuity from the 60s where people really see that as a key kind of activism that infuses all aspects of their lives. And that's and that really, you know, dropped for me. And uh, I came back inspired to really, you know, up the content of what we do in any way we can. Um, but there have just been two thoughts in my mind recently that I think maybe talk to this discussion. One, a friend remarked a little while ago, 
um, that she thinks is really important. And she's an older artist who, who came quite a lot, then got a bit disillusioned by, I think, the sort of um, the whole carbon footprint of the event. Um, but, you know, she was saying, uh, you know, that she thinks it's really imperative that the creative work of Africa Burn is mapped into the, into the South African landscape of art and culture that it's kind of, you know that it's somehow missing and how do we do that and that's a discussion we've held quite a lot I think within the art committee and within the groups and you know what kind of media uh, would be most suitable for that how can we generate the capacity to do that because everybody is so overburdened with the kinds of things that does keep us busy and then the other question I'll just try to keep this brief, is just this idea of, you know, Roland Barthes, 1960s, death of the author, the idea that an artwork, you know, meaning isn't to be found and discovered in an artwork, but it's the engagement of the reader or the audience with the work that really gives it its meaning, and that's multiple and open and varied. And uh, so kind of wondering our job, if we engaged in helping to to put the arts together is how do we how do we deepen that engagement? And you know, I think on the most negative side, where people engage very shallowly with the experience and the work, there's a kind of danger that there's a cul-de-sac there, it just like runs into an end and it's, you know, there's nothing. It's just a kind of, you know, backdrop to your to your psychedelic festy experience. So how do we how do we deepen that engagement is kind of a question that sat with me. Um, and then I just would like to read a brief quote that came to mind, which came from uh, Alex Dodd in the wake of, <clears throat> in the wake of the Fees Must Fall movement and uh, the turmoil on the campus at the University of Cape Town. Then when the university decided to remove the art, this whole debate happened. So it's a bit wordy because it was a written response. Well, I, well actually it was an interview, but if I, if I can just read this briefly, I hope that it resonates. It's a bit wordy. But she says, art is a two-way or multi-dimensional discussion. It's not just about projecting outwards and spewing your content all over an absorptive field of neutral reception, masculine metaphor fully intended in brackets. Well, it might once have mean, but not anymore. It's about the audience too, the feeling and thoughts of the audience. Participants should be taken into account. If you observe the ways in which contemporary museums and galleries are shifting, it is towards more dialogic, interactive, responsive driven, responsive driven, programmatic modes of art, which are driven by reception just as much as they are by creation. This diasporic interactive mode is not confined to social media, it's the progressive philosophical thrust of our evolving world. In both political and cultural terms, we're seeing a dethroning of authority and a movement away from individualist forms uh, towards more collective modes of expression. So yes, people's responses should be taken into account. So I'll leave it at that. Wow. I can drop that into the chat if anyone's interested. Oh, definitely. So, okay, before I pose the questions, I'll just let each and um, everyone know. So I'll ask a couple of questions to the panelists and, and, and they can engage us, but in your minds, feel uh, you can put your hands up. So I'll ask the questions about, it's about three questions. And then the, followed by, you know, we'll take the, we'll, you, we'll open the floor for any of you to also sort of add your, your questions um, to the panelists per, 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 per topic. So I'll introduce it as a topic, and then there'll be questions, and then you guys can, the, the, you know, you, you guys out there can actually ask your questions, and then we'll go to the next topic and so forth. But I must say that was that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Roger. That was uh, really ripe, um, and I'm so proud to have you and to and to share this moment with you because of the the torch that you've carried from the 80s to now. Um, one of the things that you'll notice we talk um, about the public art space is that a lot of the work that we were doing was kind of seen as as bad and not good and um, you know if you if graffiti was not allowed you couldn't paint on walls you couldn't uh, what is this thing in the desert and that's all stemmed from 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 from, from antiquated thinking 
you know. So um, part you'll see as we progress these discussions, we'll start to 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 interrogate not just our our thinking, but we'll start to influence change within the, within the art space and to actually start to to move these to get our movement wheels going because that's where we're going now. That's where we're going. It's not just about the moment in the the moment in the desert. It's really about how how this how this art influences us as we go along. So right, so so my first question then, um, and I think Roger actually spoke about it. What is this, what is Africa Burns' perceived position in the cultural sector? What role do you think it plays in transformation of the art in a changing world? Um, and I love what Ralph had to say about you know the kind of what is what is um. What, what is the, what is the, what, what, you know, how can we, I think, how did you, how did Ralph put it? It was more on, on the lines of the, the, the African and the fourth industrial revolution. So when I'm thinking about the changing world, I'm thinking myself as a creative and artist, when we probably all create in, 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 in different forms of fashion, even if you, even if you're a chef, you're an artist. Um, basically, my first question then was, what do you say to those that perceive Africa Burn as a party in the desert? versus the transformative experience. And I'd like to throw this to Kyla, Lerato, and Ralph, and Mons. Um, how, who would like to go first? Kyla, uh, Kyla and Lerato? Hello? Oh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll speak to that. <laughs> yeah, so what do, you, what do you say to those that perceive Africa Bird as a party in the desert versus a transformative experience? Um, let me go first. As somebody who's quite new to Africa Burn, um, I've been twice, I think, was it 2018 and mm. 19 that um, mm. I went, 2018 and 19. Um, and at first, there was my first festival as well. And um, so when I got there, I saw that, okay, this is, a, this is supposed to be a party, we're having fun. But um, once you really like go for a second time as well, um, and for my first time, for my first time I was working. So we went with the Wet Dream Aquarium where we made um, life-size puppets. And so we were walking around the desert with those. So, you know, I know I knew that I was there for work, but I was also there to have fun, right? Um, I noticed the artwork, definitely. Um, it was amazing. And the people, obviously, who are out there like six months prior and building these amazing structures. So for me, normally, I know that festivals are just, you know, you go, you have fun, come back home, whatever. Um, my experience with Africa Burn was that and more um, in that it was so the second time I went, I went alone. Uh, Kyla wasn't there, unfortunately, and well, just I was. We just didn't find each other. We didn't find each other, <laughs> true. But when going with it, going with uh, to Africa, burn. Normally, we go um, as a group. So this time round, I was on Facebook there. You know, finding people to go to the the burn with, um, just so that I can have that experience of. It was more of a therapeutic experience for me, if I can put it that way. Um, walking in the desert, being far away from the music as well. That's something that I picked up that I really enjoyed. Um, so it's, it's a party, but definitely more than just a party because you meet people who are also just amazing. And I don't know, like, it's, it's like you've known them for many, many years. Um, I felt safe. That's one thing that I was also very nervous about, obviously, going with somebody that you don't know um, to this far, far, far away place and um, not knowing what, what will happen. But I think there's, yeah, there's some sort of like family at Africa Burn. Everybody was saying, welcome home, you know, people have just met, welcome home. So it, it, it definitely was safe, enjoyable. Um, it's got a bit of a, you know, a lot of a spiritual experience in it as well. And yeah, man, it's, I think people need to also go to experience it for themselves. Um, everybody has their own, I think your own experience, but you can all, you know, come back and be like, oh yeah, that is a common, a common experience that I had too. 
So yeah, that's that's what I experienced going as a first time, my first burner. Do you have anything to add, Kyla? Yeah, I, I just um I uh this this is the argument that I've had most frequently with people about Africa Burn. I'm a, a staunch defender of Africa Burn in all my circles. And there's is always this thing of like, ah man, it's just a big party in the desert. And I'm like, and so is is this meant to be some kind of uh dig or some sort of like uh I, I, you know, can it not be both? Can it not be a big party in the desert and also an experiment in family making and community making and creative expression? And I mean, the theater began in the forest with everyone drinking all the wine and getting naked and, you know, like just trying to discover the human condition. So when people level that as an insult, um, I think it comes from really, it often comes from, look, I mean, there's, you're sure, there's, there, there's legitimate critiques of like privilege, and I'm sure we'll get into that as well, you know, how expensive it is to get there, um, the excess that, that, that happens, the plug and play camps, you know, there's a lot of critique and justified critique. But uh, there's also a lot of like defensiveness that I think that it's coming from a place of like, um, I don't like this. It makes me uncomfortable, you know, because Africa Burn declares these these principles that are shared values. It's it's like you know, other festivals don't get this kind of flack, and it's because they don't declare it up front, you know. And it's so much easier to to then attack the people who are trying to do or the, the the festival or the event that is is trying to do more be more um, experiment with more than it is to attack the festivals who are um and I, I mean I guess the principles are sort of asking for it and that's is what we say we are we are like engaging on a um a regular basis we do we are asking for it but it just always amazes me that you kind of by doing trying to do something positive you open yourself up to this uh criticism in a way that other events are not opened up to this kind of thing so like yeah i for me it's always been both and that's the thrill of it it is mm -hmm. it is a huge fat party in the desert where you have the most fun of your life and have the most transformative experiences of your life. And you also work harder than you've ever worked in your life because it's not just a party and you are getting up at 6 a.m. to change the batteries on the solar panel. Yeah. I mean, get the batteries out so that you can light your thing that night and you're doing all of these and you're also cooking all together and you're also meeting people and you are just like completely burning the candle at every end. And that is like thrilling. And that itself is the tr transformative experience that you are extending yourself to limits that you, you didn't even know you had, you know? So I, I think it's very easy to critique it and we must, but there's also, it's important to remember that the thing itself is transformative. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Um, so to you, Ralph and Mons, how does the transformative experience change the world anew, even in the default world? <laughs> Which, <laughs> I thought I was going to still be answering on the on the previous question about the. It's, it's uh, a dovetail, so you can okay. you can tie it in. So. so it's about the impact of it on the real world as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so just to pick up on the last one, I, I mean, uh, just briefly is so I think there's a useful distinction between the idea of the party in the desert versus the transformational experience in saying we don't want it to just be a party in the desert. But I agree with Kyler in who says that a party can't be transformational, you know. So, I mean, I, I think that there's a there's a vast difference between, say, a commercial nightclub and an underground club, um, you know, that that if you're in a, you know, a Berlin nightclub, you're part of a community. If you're in a Cape Town, you know, underground club, you're part of a community. I mean, since I was a teenager in every city I've lived in, I've been drawn to music scenes and underground parties because you find your people there and you build community. So 
I think, yeah, Africa Burn is very much about the people and the interactions uh, that you speak to someone and they are, are friendly and that you form bonds. Um, and as Lorato says, it's like people that you might have known for years is what it, what it feels like when you meet people there. Um, and I will get onto the second part of the question, but just to, to add, there's this notion of, um, you know, there's an anti-productivity uh, kind of idea, which I think is is useful to have in relation to Africa Burn, because otherwise, everything is focused um, in our in our era um, on productivity. This idea that we should be being we should be producing something, and Africa Burn is a space in which we are producing things. We're producing relationships, and we're and we're every day working to sustain ourselves, and we're making art. So it's productive in that loose sense, but it's not in terms of commerce or business or selling your labor for money. You know, it's not those kinds of productivities. And so I think in that sense, it's okay to be hedonistic. It's okay to, to, to pay attention to pleasure if pleasure is hanging out with other people and, you know, not, uh, not, uh, you know, not, not working in the normal sense of the word. And so perhaps the impact on the default world would be to carry some of those values back into the default world, which is to go actually question your um, question your day to day life um, in the in the uh, in the default world to go how much of your time are you spending uh, making money or you know what other things that you value and perhaps you could be structuring your life in a different way. Because Africa Burn is a kind of experiment. I think it's an experimental space in which we can experience what it's like to live in certain ways. So if it's an experiment, then you can carry the results of that experience uh, and that experiment back into uh, back into the default world. Thank you, uh, Mons. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I was also preparing for the other question, but it's, um, I mean, in terms in terms of the that annoying binary of like hedonistic party or transformational experience, it's like it's like any other binary. It's kind of fucking useless, actually, in my opinion. But for yeah. me, there's there's an element of the order in which things happen. Um, so so to degree there are inbuilt things in, and this is the work that us as custodians and the scaffolding that hold up the structure that is the organizational side of Africa Burn have to take care of. Um, and that is making sure that the, 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 the foundational elements, i.e. that we give the minimum of viable product, we, we create space and we challenge you to fill that space with something, a gift from your heart, something, it doesn't matter. Even if, even if your creative project is just that you've learned how to put up a tent and get a piece of rebar into the ground, that's a fundamentally creative project. And for someone that might open their heart and their minds so radically, um, that the celebration comes after that. And that's what the party is. So you do these things, you do, you, you pull together and you, and you do the difficult thing. You put up the artwork, you put up the, the theme camp, you do whatever it is. And, but, but the whole key is that it's, it's boundary challenging for you personally. And it's boundary challenging on a personal level. It's boundary challenging in terms of working with other people, with your friends. It's in a difficult environment, but it's also an incredibly beautiful environment. And so there's a lot of different layers of things that are operating there. Um, so when someone comes and puts up a huge artwork, um, it's inspiring, you know, but also whatever you can do is as valid as the giant piece of work. Um, so, 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 I mean, you know, so, so in answer to like, what do you say to trolls who are shouting about, oh, it's just a party in the desert. Those, those are just like globe and shallow understandings and it's fine you know we live in a world of media fast food where people are full of sloganeering and you know a lot of a lot of things are kind of like slogans which are empty of meaning um and really what the the, the experience in the desert is supposed to be is a and it's a it's an intense experience and it's a portal through which you leap um and there are a lot of different things. And, and that's why it's, you know, people have great times and they have the, they, they either have the best time of their life or the worst time of their life, but they're both transformational, you know. Um, you can't have a medium experience. 
Um, and so, so those are just the kind of elements that are that are really operating there. Um, but yeah, so it's the participatory ethic. It's the kind of keeping that space. And, and like I said, that's the work that, that we that are the SCAF have to do, keeping those elements pure, like not letting the service mentality slip into it, not letting, you know, like the plug and play camps. Um, one of the things that I experienced um, when I went to Burning Man in 2013, after a very long break from being from there, be, being there, uh, there was something unsettling about it for me because I'd been there many years ago uh, I'd been there in 2004 which is when I kind of got the idea for me personally to get involved in starting the burn and I <laughs> I just remember like and I couldn't put my finger on what was bothering me and then eventually I was able to name it and that was that it started it had it had been such a long gap that I'd been there that it had started feeling really produced like someone had come in professionals had come in and built these in insanely beautiful artworks and so for me when you see an artwork that is a beautiful thing but I'm not sensing the human endeavor behind it it starts leaching a bit of the so, so if it's utterly professionalized it doesn't for me it doesn't have the same feeling but I'm, I'm in a very privileged position in that I understand all the stories behind the artworks um, and so that speaks to the fact that that process is actually always more important than the end product so, which is why when we have these theoretically struggling or failed pieces, they're not that. They are performance pieces. And in fact, even I would even problematize the, 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 the word art. You know, these aren't artworks. They are physical manifestations of communal effort, of practicing imagining, of toiling together, of creativity, which is essentially a you know a huge group of people adding their mix in and it's always been such a lovely thing where you see someone puts up a beautiful artwork and someone walks past and goes oh I'll like that in a different way to whatever you'd ever thought you could and then someone else does a projection on it and someone else offers to help you burn it and so that's the collaborative that's really the alchemy that happens in that space and then very simply to the second question is like you can't go and be transformed in that manner personally and then not bring it back into the default world you know and and certainly from the start of um the beginning of of the africa burn experiment to now um i have witnessed insane changes in the world in our world like you know in the groups of people that i know who have formed creative collectives and they, they don't ever stop creating once you start you're an addict you can't stop doing that stuff um and it's, it's really centers around being brave, uh, authentic, creative, and experimental, and just forking for it, basically. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, so, and then for this question, I'd like to, um, to, to put perhaps Mons and Roger again in this. So the question is, what do you say to those who argue the burning of art against the backdrop of a country that has people living in shacks who would appreciate such material to build their homes? And so that's the question if you want to ponder. Um, and I will just, I've, I've been asked this question as well. Um, uh, but person, and, and yeah, it's, a, it's, it's almost, a, it's a difficult question, but um, I think as we, as we will get deeper into the, the, that kind of understanding. But uh, what do you say to those who argue the burning of art against the backdrop of a country that has people living in shacks who would appreciate such material to build their homes? And I ask this to Roger and Mons and Rolf, if you want to, if you want to chime in, any, any of our panelists who want to, but I ask it to, to Roger and Mons. Um, yeah. You want me to go first, Rog? <laughs> okay, let me just say something first, because I know, Manjeev, have thought about this a lot, but um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's certainly something that worries me a lot, and I think it bothers a lot of people, um, but of course it talks to, you know, uh, just the much larger consumption and carbon footprint of the whole event, how much, you know, how much your entire carbon footprint is worth. Timben itself is a renewable resource, and if it is handled well, in itself is not the issue, but I think it talks to our sensibility and the and the incredible gap 
between the excesses of the wealthy and the you know and the overwhelming needs of people in poverty so it's something we should really pay attention to and engage with um and it has certainly formed the uh, the center of a lot of discussions yeah i mean there's for me there's there's no there's no um there's no proper yeah. solid answer to that. Um, I, I'm just going to give you a little bit of data um, in terms of how we have approached it in terms of what we can do. Um, and that is that, um, so, so, you know, when we do, when we do uh, grant assessments, uh, so we've got a creative grant part and then we do creative grant assessments and basically the weighting of um, and, and you get a score sheet and then that's how we decide what gets funded and what goes to the desert. Um, and so, so we started off with a very um, re recycle heavy um, ethic, um, which actually came from, from my, my years at um, Mother City Queer Projects, which Ralph will know about, is, is the whole brief there was to turn waste into art. So for many years, and especially in the early days of the Africa Burn, I don't think there was any clean material used ever. Actually, it was all we, we would go and scour materials from the um, from uh, movie sets that were being broken down, um, which we have continued to do. But there's also we've also got a resource kind of um, um, where we 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 basically are very heavily we we will fund things easier if it, they are made out of um, waste products however that doesn't mean <laughs> that waste products cannot make shacks because obviously most shacks in this country are made out of waste products as any waste wood etc um so the other thing that i'd like to say is also that the volume of of materials used is actually not that much these are very long thin hollow structures um, the other thing that we've also been doing is um, getting the, so we've, we've instituted a, um, a kind of scenario where you actually have to apply to burn your artwork. You cannot just burn it. And so for the last, I think, three years, we've had that system where people have actually got to motivate that that's part of the actual work. So theoretically, the only piece that is going to burn is the, the clan effigy. Um, yeah, so, so like Roger says, I think that it's, it's a far bigger question around haves and have nots um, in, a, in a radically unequal society. Um, and, I, and, and I feel like it's possibly not within the realm of, a, of, a, of an event of this, even though we want to, because as Kyla says, you know, by putting these principles out before us and saying things like we aim to invent the world anew, um, we do put ourselves up for that kind of criticism because we are idealistic. Um, and so we have to face that. Um, yeah. But I will say that there's a lot of effort to redeploy those materials afterwards. Um, and certainly there's, there's quite a few houses in Tanqua that are made out of all of the X artworks um, as well as, um, yeah. But yeah, the, the, yeah. The, but, but I do want to just a slight kind of excuse is that is, is that the, yeah. the volume of wood that is burnt is really not a lot. Okay, thanks, Mons. I like I like that. Um, and and Ralph, can you just um, I see we've got some hands up. So I will after this question just fill uh, a couple of uh, questions and then I'll end off with on this particular topic with Thomas, who just wanted to talk about the experience as well. So yeah. Ralph, I know that uh, you touched. You touched on um, on the hedonism, and that is this this kind of event is actually a subculture. It's very and and it it would be very hard to reach the kind of the, the South African demographic in in this space because it's such a almost like a subculture type of event, um, and because it's and the nature of it in general, um, and and yes, I think it is an opportunity for like an each one teach one moment. Um, and that's part of the kind of programs that we that we do in terms of outreach, in terms of arts development, um, and and through the NATI programs to give back. And how, how can we and the spark grants as well? How do we go back into that? So and and, and touching base that community and, and that sort of thing. So I'm 
I mean, I, I get asked that question a lot, so I'm just like sort of interjecting there, but to say, can you just touch on the, on that question as well? How do you feel about us burning art in the backdrop of this country? And if you can just also reel it into uh, that subculture yeah. understanding. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, we're talking a lot about the symbolism, you know, of like it's symbolically could be troubling to see a kind of destroying of, of, um, of materials in a country with a lot of poverty, but it's so wide. I mean, that experience, I mean, every time, every time you eat in a restaurant, you'd be like, I'm wasting money eating in a restaurant and people don't have enough to eat. Or there's this kind of worthiness as well around, um, uh, European children being told to finish their dinners because their children starving in Africa. Um, so our, our, our lives are very um, uh, implicated in, in almost everything we do with, with inequality. Um, I, I think maybe to shift it a little bit and look at what is the reason why people, why we're burning things that Africa burn? You know, what is the, what is the symbolism? You know, is it to do, it's to do with a kind of, um, rejection of materialism or um, an idea of this very ancient joy in fire as this destroyer, you know, like reveling in destructive forces, you know, that these are, these are very ancient forces that we are in awe of. I mean, I think the experience of standing around a big burning uh, structure is quite incredible. You know, everybody is absorbed in the fire. I mean, if you take the experience of just being around a campfire and how people get absorbed in it, like um, in, in a small fire, and then you have a huge fire and you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of people around it. It's a very, I think it's a very intense and you could say spiritual experience to be communing with this destructive natural force that goes back, you know, many millennia before we were even homo sapiens. And we've got this long ancestral memory of it. Um, and like you could even, I mean, the, there are other, there are other subcultural groups that destroy things, you know, it's like Scotana or, you know, like sort of destroying um, clothing, yes. burning, burning, burning money in poor communities, in, yeah. In, yeah. In, in townships. It's like, it's demonstrating this rejection of the power that material things have over you. It's to go, I'm, 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 I'm more than that, or, you know, I, I can destroy this thing, which is supposed to have me in its power. So yeah, perhaps to, to, to shift to the looking at what, what, what that's, what that symbolism is about, what it achieves. Thank you. So uh, before I um, field those questions, there's one last question, which is to Lorraine. Um, and and yeah, and uh, to Lorraine, and then I will I will I will fill the questions. You can put your questions um in the box, and I can read them, or you guys can actually just ask the questions directly yourself. That's to those who have put their hands up. Um, Lorraine, the demographic of participants is often brought up, with many calling for a demographic that reflects the South African context. What has been achieved, and what needs to be addressed, and what should we realistically strive for? Uh, this is for Lorraine. Thank you, Cindy. I mean, yeah, I often refer to Africa Burn as being a community that's the photo negative of South African society, because obviously, given that it is at a distance to kind of like major centers, it is economic, there is quite a significant economic barrier in terms of participation and resources that it obviously comes up as being something where it's normally attended by a majority of white people. So, yeah, it's something that certainly when we have a principle that's called radical inclusion, we need to look at it and we need to look at what we're doing as a community to disrupt our, our kind of like the makeup of the community that is Africa Burn. And... I think that um, it's certainly moving in the right direction. I certainly think from my perspective that I see a lot more um, kind of like performance and artwork that um, reflects creative expression of a South African context. And we've certainly done a lot of work within the Africa Burn Org in terms of trying to break down those systemic barriers and 
encourage people to come. There's still a lot of work to do on that front. And I think what's really encouraging is when you have an engagement with a theme camp that's decided they're gonna they're gonna look at that and they're gonna look at what um, what's going on in their day-to-day -day lives in the default world and saying, is my own circle diverse enough in the default world? How do I make it more diverse? And then how do I make Africa Burn a place that is more comfortable for people to attend? And it was really lovely to hear that Lorato said it was a place that she felt, felt safe because I think that's one of the challenges that I've seen come up is people not knowing whether they feel safe in a place where the majority of people don't show up in the world like they do. So um, what's also I think important is that Africa Burn, the event in the desert, isn't the only thing that Africa Burn does or that Africa Burn tries to instigate. So if you look at things like Streetopia, if you look at other projects, like when we did the tour around the Northern Cape Blank Canvas Express and taking various collaborators and Kyla and her crew were one of those collaborators, that we have that opportunity to bring those kinds of ethics and principles and ideals and playfulness and experimentation into places that are more accessible and are more comfortable and those bridges can be built in that way. So, so yeah, I mean, there still obviously is um, a long way to go. And a couple of years ago, we actually recontextualized that principle of radical inclusion in a South African context because we felt that um, welcoming the stranger just doesn't cut it in our country so we we did a lot of work around that and trying to use that as a way to kind of increase and birth more attention to these kinds of things thank you all right thanks Lars. so thomas i believe you had something to say my brother <laughs> unmute Yes. Uh, so, hi. Uh, actually, I want to uh, um, answer the first question, and uh, that somehow is including all the other questions. It, it for me, it feels like it's just one question. Yes. Um, so, for um, maybe to say, I'm a light artist. I work for fe um, music festivals all around the world. Uh, obviously, not at the moment. But um, the thing is how I ended up at Africa Burn was with the Lighthouse in 2016. And I did, a new, I did get a new career as a light artist I didn't ask for. And now it's my job. And so what is the position of Africa Burn in the festival scene? You don't go to Africa Burn and then you just had a great time and you come back home. It changes your life. It can change your life dramatically and it can actually do many things. It, it can be an accelerator for your career, which is sometimes a bit delicate to balance, like the DJ who wants to have his set on SoundCloud where it stands like Burning Man and it gets like loads of plays. Is that fine? Maybe not, like the influencers as well. It's kind of a tricky thing. But I know many people in South Africa who, who went to burn and they came back home with a new job because they met their new boss. I know people who went there and helped some rich kids from Europe to build an artwork. And uh, after that, they, in the winter, when everybody is struggling in South Africa, they went for the festival scene to Europe to build that fusion garbage or boom. Mm -hmm. um, so it can help people a lot to get like big steps in their life and actually pay their bills with things they even didn't thought about before. And um, I met someone who said, oh, I love the lights at the lighthouse. You know, I was standing there all night long and I couldn't leave because of your lights. They were so amazing. And next to me, there was a beautiful woman standing who couldn't leave as well. And at some point we started talking and that's our kids. So they're family now. Yeah. And um, so there's a lot of connection going on. And um, even with that crew, we came down 42 people from Switzerland. I think many of us didn't realize like how privileged we are in you know, just a hundred bucks or whatever. You don't get the reality of how things are 
but you can't block it out as a tourist that much because it is a burn. It does way more, you, you can't look away. We had like a large budget we brought with us. It was like, I think 400 or no, it was 600,000 rand we spent for that project. Mm -hmm. And we brought that whole money down. And then we had talks like, what do you want to go to macro to buy these things? Check out like for a small shop. Yeah, mm -hmm. and such. Okay. And I know people who do customs and then there's the Burner Bazaar and then all the Europeans uh, float in and just shop mad and they sell a lot of things and then they get budget as well. And now they do films, um, costumes for film sets in the, in the film industry. So they have a whole new business. And so it does a lot of um, things for the people behind because it goes way deeper than a normal event where you just go and consume. So it's like the interaction. You actually, you, you arrive maybe as a tourist, but you leave as a traveler because of the whole connection. So it is a lot of um, development aid that happens. Uh, we had like one of our crew was falling in love with a South African guy and he was one of the first black um, people who were living in a port in Cape Town who was just white before. So she was telling us the whole story about that change because he was like the first guy who moved in in a new space where everybody looked at him first. So, and we even realized that like we have colored people with us, Swiss guys, and then we met people and sometimes people were just skipping these guys with shaking hands and it was like, what the fuck is going on here? So it gives you a lot of awareness that changes, that gives you an idea what Africa needs. Yeah. That goes way deeper than every other festival you could attend because normally it's about like what you get yeah and as I'm from both worlds I'm sometimes struggle a lot with both things I'm involved as an artist a lot in Africa Burns so and I still see most people I know from Switzerland here where I'm sitting now or going there as tourists but they're bringing a lot of money in and they're um I try to make the awareness that they spend it wisely. And when they're involved in projects, when they're involved in camps, when they're involved in artworks, it automatically happens that they get this connection and they actually get the awareness that they realize, hey, maybe I really should go to a township and because I know some people now. And maybe I really should buy the more expensive tickets so other people can afford to go there. Hey, it was too white there. And we never thought about like white dish like how white like a society is because that's just not the issue here yeah. so i think that's that's what makes it like very different to like a normal music festivals and there's a lot of um, opportunities and i think it's uh it's a tough challenge to work on all these things because there is privilege and we i, I always say yeah there's a lot of privilege at Africa Burn, but the people who go there, maybe even if they're are part of the white privilege, mm -hmm. these people are not part of the problem, they are part of the solution. That's fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much, Thomas. I love that. Can um, Robert Schroeder, you are next, my brother, For um, if you could pose your question, followed by Nathan. Robert? Have we lost Robert? Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, um, I'm, I'm actually didn't realize that I put myself in line for a question, but I am supporting what I'm hearing over here. And it is, it's a festival, it's the white privilege has, people have got to be invited and they're going to, be, they're going to want to be part of Africa Bird. It doesn't make a difference whether you're white or black or, whatever, or anything like that. People have got to, they're going to be aware of, the, of Africa burning the experience and they must be enticed into the experience and be opened up into it. Yeah. So um, I, I didn't really have anything to ask, but okay. that's just my thought. And I Thank didn't realize you. that I put myself in line yet. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thank you, Nathan, and then Kyla, and then uh, I believe Mons is next after Nathan. Yes, hi everybody. 
I just want to add a bit to the issues. That's not really a question. It's just adding to the issue of of the burning of materials that could potentially be put to better use. And I think, as Ralph said, that can that argument is valid for any activity that is any luxury or leisure activity that can the, can the materials um, be put to some better use. And I think that although it's a, it's is it can it's equally valid for anything else, it doesn't mean that it is not a relevant question. I think it is a very relevant question. And I think that when one looks at that and you see you've got your, there's a material that could potentially be um, used to build a house or two houses or three or four, um, that you, can I do something better with this material? Can I engage in a process where this material does more than build four houses? Where I, where by including people, by empowering people, by, um, by giving people pride in the process of the build, can I maybe, am I doing, maybe doing more than building a house? And by the effect that the piece has on people. So if you, if you, if you are just burning material that could be used to build a house, that, that is, that I would recommend that. But if you, the process and the outcome of whatever it is that you're building is bigger than a house, then I think that's, um, that's something you've got to look at when you burn that material. Thank you That's so it. much, Nathan. Thank you so much for that. Cool. So you've just given us some food for thought. Consider like how you're using your pieces and stuff. What can be salvaged to be repurposed again? Um, Kyla, uh, sorry, I believe Monique, you had something to say? Uh, yeah, it was it was also again in uh, I actually forgot to say it earlier when I was talking about the burning of stuff. Um, and that's that it's similar to what Nathan is saying and what Ralph said, but but specifically, I just wanted to ref, uh, reference the kind of history of of the burn that that impulse to burn and 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 the kind of the anti establishment kind of underground route of burns um, and that's and, and and so in a in a way part part of the development of the burn is is a response and this this kind of speaks to the decommodification principle is is, is a response to our default world basically where everything is very passively consumptive and there's a there's a kind of unidirectional relationship and and this this was very true in art as well is you know you it, it was a movement away from the kind of like art in the gallery kind of scenario where where um it's it's a very separated relationship with a the thing there's the thing and here's me and you know it's an air-conditioned white space or whatever um but to a degree there's a statement um and and it speaks to what nathan was saying earlier there's a statement in being able to build a big thing and then release it into the ethers. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, 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 it's the anti kind of like monumental, this is me, this is my sculpture thing. You know, it's like, here's a beautiful thing and here we release it. And that, that for me is also quite an important aspect um, and moment um, with regard to burning at least one structure, one large structure at the event. Yeah. Um, and that is all. Thank you. Uh, Kyla and Lerata, did you have something to say before we go? So we not, then we'll close this off and we'll go to our last topics. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I just want to, these, these are very interesting points. Um, it's really great to hear about the history and about the thinking behind. Um, I want to bring the conversation back to why we wanted to be part of this panel, which is the idea of holding a mirror up to society, um, South African society and transformation in particular. Um, yeah, we, uh, the, the, if, for me, it's a question of access. We have only to look at this room to see that there is, it is not a mirror of South African society. And we can talk, we can kind of justify and say, 
um, you know, the question of, of the, I think it was Ralph who was talking about the Scotanis and the, so we can, we can talk about it in a sort of intellectual, and that's all very interesting, but the, the, the point is, it is problematic. It, it, it is really problematic, and it's something that we need to have an active plan for. We, um, apart from Lerato and Mli and the people of color who have now joined our Byrne family, apart from them being our dear friends and collaborators, I actively recruited them to the Byrne because we were really deeply uncomfortable with being an all white camp. Um, and seeing around us all white camps. The last time we went to the burn, I felt a, a very uh, distinct, um, um, it was, the, it was the, the, I mean, the last big burn, I mean, um, for us with the Wet Dream Aquarium. There was a real, I mean, someone drove in with a Nazi flag flying high, but we, we'll just uh, leave that for now. Um, but it also talks to this idea of freedom of expression and, hey man, I'm all just, you know, but, but another deeply uncomfortable part of that burn was this, this divide of like, you know, the workers, the people who were setting up the camps, hey? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say and, too. And, and then the people who were kind of uh, really at the burn. Mm. So there are these things, these, there's very real things. And, and what we're talking about here is super interesting. And I can talk about it for hours and days. But I really want to bring us back to why we are here on this and why we accepted the invite to this panel, which is that, that we need to have an active plan for transformation. Transformation is uncomfortable. Um, it is emotional. It is traumatic for white and black South Africans. Uh, well, black and white South Africans. And we it's not something that we're going to be able to uh, coast, uh, coast through or, or kind of intellectualize our way through. I don't know if you want to add to that. Um, yeah, I'd love to add to that. Um, so <clears throat> just to speak more about like um, the segregation part of things. Um, so I went obviously to Africa Burn once with the Wet Dream Aquarium, um, the whole team. And once I went alone and I camped with, um, I forgot the camp that I camped with, but there were a team from um, Cape Town and also just some artists and stuff. But um, there was definitely a like a, a, a feeling of segregation in the sense that I saw some workers pitching tents and stuff like that. And um, when I would go and approach the guys and speak to them, they kind of had a thing of, oh, no, but we we here to work. And I was also there to work, obviously. Um, but already it's like they know that we're not allowed to. We can engage, but we're not here for the vibe of it. We're just here to pitch the tents and then we move on, you know? And I, I, and then when you're in the actual festival, there's this amazing like, you know, flow of conversation with the people who are there for um, the actual festival and are there at the festival working. But because I was, you know, with Kyla and them, I got like a different type of, you know, treatment. And then when I would walk around alone, it was more like, okay, I feel like, yeah, I haven't come with my white friends. Um, I'm here alone. Um, but also because I've been to the burn, I think I had a sense of, I know where to go. Um, there was one camp that definitely like looked after me, um, the hydration station. They were quite cool with me. Um, and that was before the camp that I was going to camp with arrived so yeah man there's definitely a feeling of segregation in some way and if we could include everybody it would be amazing because that's what we always say when we go back into the you know default world it's you need to go to this place Africa burn it's so amazing and it really is but there's those few you know aspects about it that we can I think make better um living in a community uh, where, you know, it's rural vibes and you don't really hear about festivals. Not a lot of people of color also hear about the festival. That's another thing I noticed. When mm. I would tell them about it, they would be like, what is this place? It sounds so great because, you know, growing up um, as a black uh, woman, I was in the wilderness, going back home to Mpumalanga, you're cooking with fire tonight because there's not enough money for electricity um 
whatever you're sharing with Makelo and they're from next door because you don't have this and that. And Africa Burn has that relationship and all of those things, but there is a little lack of, you know, I think we do need more people of color. They would enjoy it so much. That's why. And that I also said feels like home because I could resonate with, oh, okay, I need to walk all over there to go and take a dump <laughs> or use the toilet. Um, or I'm bathing in a, a little tub of water. This is the amount of water I have. I need to make sure that I get, you know, clean. So it's got all of that, but it definitely does have some sort of like, oh no, we've been here before. You working there to pitch tents though, you know? So yeah, yeah that's no, that that's a good Yeah, No, definitely, I got you. And I think that's gonna be part of our access conversation which is like another one of the questions that we're going to pose it, it's a it's a it's a deep and hard conversation that we're having right now um but um i'm going to go to the second question months and then i'm sure it, it'll it'll come up because we're getting in now in the heart of it we're talking about what are the organization's structural challenges and how they are reflected in the ab community that's our thinking what are our structural challenges can we all take a moment to think about the kind of things that we see, like what are, our, what are our challenges really? And the question for that to our panelists is looking at the demographics of the organizing team who are, who are operating in the default world, you know, to create this or to prepare for the space. What, what would an ideal team look like and why have we not achieved this after 13 years? Lorraine and Mons, would you like to tap into this? Mons, you can start. Uh, no, I mean, I think there was just a piece of um, conversation that I wanted to lob on to what Lerata said, so I'd, I'd prefer if, if, Lor if Lorraine took this, though. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you just then, then, then you may quickly uh, touch on what uh, Lerata said, and then Lars will answer the question. Uh, okay, no, no, it's just, there's, there's a very good um, group on Instagram called the Black Burner Project, um, and they are from Burning Man. Um, and basically it was just a, a, a black burner who was just like, I want to find the others, you know? Um, and so she started and then it's, it's great. And so she has these, and I actually urge everyone, you know, as part of just like getting a deeper understanding of, because I know, I know we South Africa, but there's, there are some parallels. And I was listening to um, a discussion that, that she was having with a guy, um, a New Yorker. And he was like, no, man, Jesus, I find my people. And I'm like, you know, get on well with them. And I go to, to my same camp every year. And what, what they do in the Blackburn Project is that they basically state a date and everyone goes to the man and they take a, boat, a photograph of all the Blackburners at Burning Man. Okay, well, I mean, as many as, as, as will arrive, you know. Um, but she's just trying to build the snowball of awareness. But one of these... Um, one of the one of the conversation pieces was about this guy saying, "No, you know, I've I've got my people and I feel very at home and everything," and he said, "But I know, I know that if I was in a if I was in the majority, if if I was in a camp of dominated by black people, you know, it's fine to have one kind of in the group, but if I was if you know, he he totally read that that would have a different attitude, which I found very interesting, just as a tack on. But I mean, there's a much bigger other conversation and." But I totally agree with Kyla and Lerato. It's not a, we can, no one can be passive about integration. You know, it requires, because of the radical history of structural racism and, you know, all of that kind of stuff is, is we, we cannot be passive about it. And even where we are active, we need to amplify those activities. So, but I'm gonna hand over to Lorraine. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think one of the one of the challenges we face is that as an organization, we often tend to be wanting the community to attend to the challenges rather than addressing them ourselves and looking at ourselves as an organization. And yeah, I mean, as a structure, we seek to be a flat structure. But more often than not, our decision-making circles end up being white. They often end up being white 40 plus, and they often end up being white 40 plus male. So it is a huge, it is a huge challenge for the organization sometimes to even broach some of 
the issues and the topics around transformation and drill down into those things and do the hard work because fragility comes up or it's not seen as being an issue. So having to constantly put that on the table. And I mean, interestingly, I'm just going to pop out to the regional network now. There was a conversation around increasing diversity and inclusion in our burn space and at our events. And I dived into the topic and I gave a whole rundown of blah, 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 Africa Burn, and it popped into a Facebook space and then came back again. And someone was saying, I'm going to champion this. Let's have a Zoom chat, blah, 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 blah. Then when it was put forward by another person that you can't just have a chat about it, there needs to be a plan, there needs to be action. The champion decided that that was too that was too much effort for them. So it's certainly it's certainly making sure that um, those of those of us who are in leadership positions model the behaviour of stepping out of the way and letting other people take those decision making circles and ensure that they are diverse and ensure that those things are heard. And it's also around making sure that when we're recruiting for the membership, that we're thinking about who are the people that are making these decisions, who are the people that get to vote on these things. When, um, when the call out for directors, et cetera, goes out, that people are actively seeking people of color and women to fill those positions. And thankfully that is starting to have some impact and people are coming into those spaces but it is it is a it is a long slog and what this reflects back is that oftentimes those discussions don't get the prominence and importance at the table in our meetings in our boss barad that we have on a yearly basis where we take stock of where we are and where we're going, those kinds of things. So it's it's a push to make sure that that, that plan and that agenda is prominent and it's front and centre all of the time. And that, that for me is what the organisation needs to do. I mean, in the past, we've instituted some diversity literacy, which kind of went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> and it... Um, it showed us really how fragile we are and um, how much work we have to do and how we do push it onto other people. And later on, when we talk about access, I can kind of bring that back in a visual and um, share with you what I, I feel is reflected back at me when I try and in, like improve and build the kind of access programs and bring other people into those access programs to develop them further. So, yeah, I see that someone else has their hand up. Yes, I think um, Alex Marsh, would you like to say something on this before I ha I'd like to pose a question to Kyla and to Lerato specifically and Kyla, but Alex, please go ahead. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, yeah, just to come in here, because I mean, the reason that I became more involved in Africa Burn about five years ago was, was about this issue. It was about inclusivity um, and how we start to shift wh where decision-making is located and the demographics of decision-making because the same kind of decisions are gonna be made if the same kind of people are those who get to make the decisions. Um, and I've experienced, yeah, like as, as Lars said, like the resistance, the stuff is hard. And if you're not willing to sit in discomfort, then like nothing is going to change. Um, and I've also experienced over the years how, you know, like as a person of color bringing up these issues consistently um, and being very much in the minority in the space, um, how like you get exhausted um, and, you know, and, and people of color move out because they can't continue to uh, bring the same sentiment that is so personal and vulnerable um, if, if they're not deeply feeling heard. And so I think 
what is also so important as we do this work more and better and make it um, uh, get it done in a way that is more systemic. Um, we also need to not put the expectation on the people of color um, to be the ones doing all of this work. Um, there needs to be like what, what we need is for our allies, for, for the white people in the space to take personal responsibility for becoming racially literate, for trying to examine their privilege and figure out how that affects how they move in space, for how they make space and um, not just by removing themselves from it, but by being able to support in the way that support is useful. So that there is such a critical role for all of us in this. Um, and the more we're able to have like honest and comfortable conversations in solidarity with each other, the, the more we can figure out how we do this together. That's it. Just, uh, no, no, no. I just want to just stay on the because um, I think I'll pose this one quickly to, to you and then we need to move because we're running up out of time. Then we need to go to Lorraine's pre presentation about and, and the conversation about access. Um, so Alex and Lerato and Kyla, um, I have a question and it is given that a Africa Burn is a volunteer based organization and that there is an argument amongst people of color that they cannot afford to volunteer. Would you consider volunteer to be an act of privilege? Lerato, Kyla, Alex? Yeah, at, at first I think it is, yeah. Um, I think as Lerato says, like uh, she had to get there first to understand what it was all about. And once she was there and had been uh, gone, gone even for a second time, then there was this understanding of like, ah, oh, that's what you mean by volunteer. That's what you mean by, uh, I mean, I'm speaking on your sure. behalf, I'm sorry, it's but okay. I, I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm just drawing from her example that I think, um, I mean, what's that silly triangle that everybody quotes that is not really no longer relevant, but still stuck in my mind, the hierarchy of needs. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah, I know, I know. It's not my best either, but I, I do always think of this like, okay, let's talk of it in terms of an oxygen mask, right? You can't help to put on someone else's oxygen mask until you've done your own, even your own children, you know? Um, so, so there is this sense of like, uh, what are you saying, as Alex just so beautifully put, you know, it's like, what, what are you saying? I, I need to, to volunteer. I mean, I'm, I'm too busy trying to live. And even and when I do like get, the, the, get it together to go to Africa Burn, I am going to have fun. I'm not going to volunteer, you know. But then, you know, once you're there and once you are part, you are included, then there's understanding, there's an understanding of what is meant by volunteerism and uh, participation. Um, but I think it's may maybe we need to talk specifically around this word, you know, like, um, yeah. yeah. And, and it, does around, a, it does have a connotation of privilege. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, like Lerata, you're just talking about um, being part of the community, Emakaya, where everybody, Yes, we're all going to eat together. We're all going to enjoy the fire. We're all going to enjoy the compote, whatever. But each of us have got something to do. That communal effort, it sure. ties in. But when you when you've got nothing to give, when you feel like you've got no, you, you can't even get there. You're struggling to get there. How how do you give back when you when you feel like you've got nothing? What do you feel about um, the if, the volunteer community? I'm I'm talking about even organizationally, at you know where. You you have volunteers come in and do stuff, and but to get to, get, to catch a taxi to get mm. there is a problem. I'm talking as a person of color. Mm. Mm. Um. Yeah. No. Definitely. So, like I said, I think I was lucky enough to obviously have well worn theater to be the reason that I'm at Africa Burn or that I know of Africa Burn and that I can get there because my transport was covered. I knew that the tickets were nice and cheap. I had people who are already looking after me. So 
now I'm going to go and tell a friend of mine, hey, there's this amazing festival, which I have already, and tell them the great things about it. But then how, <laughs> how do I expect them to get there, you know? So I always have, like, people saying, well, can't you just, like, slot us into your, you know, um, theatre group and we'll just, like, <laughs> get there? Because it's definitely a struggle to get there. And it's a struggle to know that once you're there, you have to survive also, you know, yes, camps will give you food and stuff like that, but you need to be able to sustain for yourself. And unfortunately, you must make sure that you've got food as well. You are ready for the big, um, yeah, the big bang. Um, but I, I definitely think it's a problem. And um, I think that's why I'm also kind of you, get yeah. to, rep to represent for those people who are like, hey, I would love to, but I really, I can't afford it, you know, and um, with volunteering as an artist, I know, you know, the tickets are cheaper, but is there no other way or alternative for people who aren't volunteering and just want to go and have fun um, to get there? Because I also learned so much um, just about the environment and how we need to look after, you know, um, Mother Nature from Africa Burn. And normally festivals, you go, you have fun, you drink, party, drugs, go back home. There's nothing that you really, you know, take from it. Africa Burn, there's something that you always learn. There's people that you meet that teach you something about something. Um, so I really think it's, for me, it's like a therapeutic se session. Like I said, it's right. almost like a retreat of some sort. And I think it, it, it's very important that people get the opportunity to go and not feel like, hey, because I can't afford it, I guess I'll just sit so, still and just be here um yeah so that speaks to um the access question just quickly alex do you have anything to add about volunteerism being an act of privilege or that you feel like it resonates with communal efforts and it's a way of giving back or and particularly uh people in marginalized communities like is that a hindrance I mean, I think that it's absolutely an act of privilege. And, and I, just to say that like the whole idea of barriers to access has always, um, I feel so thoughtful about it because I think those barriers happen like at an individual level, like the barriers that you have inside of yourself that happen in terms of the communities you relate to and like how, how they're formed. Um, and how tight they are and then at a structural level so you know we need to be looking at them at all of those levels and the idea of inclusivity is also something that's like an active thing that we need to do it's not something that we can say that we are and for that to make it true um and, and maybe my last thoughts around um volunteerism as a privilege is that you know often when when people uh, take umbrage at the idea of privilege um, that they experience it as some kind of attack and I, I don't think I mean that's just it's not the case I think that that all that is the the ask when when we we ask everybody to spend some time thinking about their positionality and what that does to how they are in the world and how they are in relation to the people around them is just to acknowledge it. Like not, we're not, not asking anybody to be apologetic about how they show up in the world. Um, we, we want all of the diversity um, and we want to be able to celebrate each other. It's just a case of acknowledging like this is who I am. And because of all of these intersecting points of my identity, this is how I show up. Um, and then we can have a, a more real conversation with each other. Yeah, that's me. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, thanks Alex. So uh, we're going to move on to our next question. We have 25 minutes basically left. Um, so we're going to talk about how accessible are the access programs for marginalized artists. Um, Lorraine, what are the perceptions of access programs within the AB organization? Could you please um, talk us through that and, and with your presentation? Sure, I'm going to share my screen. My um, internet connection is really quite unstable because we are getting towards the end of our load shedding cycle. So I'd really appreciate if people can turn their videos off because I worry that I won't be able to share my screen properly, but I'm going to give it a whirl. Thank you, Lars. And 
Ooh, hold on. No, that's not working. I need to do this full screen first, sorry. Is that okay, you guys turn your video off? Right next to mute, it says start or it says stop video. So that Lars can get the full, thank you guys. Sorry, I'm just being over 40 and not working this out, how to do it full screen. <laughs> Sorry. This is not working very well. Okay. It keeps telling me it's failing, which is not very helpful. Um, I'm hearing. Sorry, it keeps telling me that the screen sharing is failing, so I'm not entirely sure what I am doing wrong, but I will try again. Cindy, maybe uh, that there was someone that had a hand up. Was it uh, Ralph? It was, maybe he wants to come in was, while I was trying to figure this out. Yes, sure. And then um, while she's also busy doing that, I wanted to read some of the comments that people had. Or we can just do that after him. Ralph, what you got to say? Hey, I was just interested in the topic of volunteerism because, uh, yeah, like the pre presentation is up. But just to say it quickly, I think it's also interesting. It's obviously a lot to do with socioeconomic factors, whether you can afford to be a volunteer or not. And that yeah. coincides with race a lot in South Africa. But also, it also is about your profession. Like artists often get asked to do stuff for free, yeah. whereas mechanics and doctors don't. Um, and in my experience of being largely self-employed and, and an artist for most of my adult life, it's interesting when you don't have a full-time job, you also have time that other people can use. And when you're an artist, people think that you should do things for free. So I think there's also a way to look at volunteerism around why do we ask certain groups of people in terms of their professions and their vocations to volunteer their services while other groups of people uh, don't get asked to do that. Thanks, thanks Rob, that's perfect. Okay, Lars, you're up. Cool. Um, so yeah, so um, this is a little meme that I made, golly, it's nearly a couple of years ago now because I kept running into discussions with people within the organization who, seemed to think that the Anati program was a program that went out and dragged people of color to Africa Burn to fulfill a desire to not look so white. And also the questions and discussions that I tended to get into were around the idea that because some of the groups from Cape Town collaborate and come on an overland truck together, that I am creating a ghetto um, but yet all white camps collaborating and sharing stuff is just the norm. It's just how it is. So there's, there was never any question about that setup, but there was a question about people of color all camping together and it looks like a ghetto. So I made this little meme. And of course, here we have um, Ed Sheeran doing his poverty porn thing. And he won an award by Radiate, which is a Norwegian um, organization who hand out awards for people because their campaigns are so blimmin' awful. And it's an attempt to create dignity in the charity sector. As I said, well, the ops team scene is a ghetto. <laughs> um, for some participants, it really is like the one or two faces in a sea of white people but when we actually look at what the artists that come to Africa Burn that are people of color, they produce amazing artworks, they are professional artists. And when COVID isn't affecting us, they're touring the world with their art. So it's really problematic that there is a perception that 
there are some people in the organization that literally go out and fetch people to make up the numbers. So a little overview of how the Anati program has evolved over the previous three years of which we had, had an event. We've done a lot more um, engagement. So for example, Cindy and Monique and I did a round of going out to different communities, going to fringe communities and going to places like Kailicha to um, the Shack, the Shack Theatre, Makokanye there to have conversations. So going with artists who are already part of Africa Burn and reaching out into their, their networks and engaging in their spaces. And through these various processes, it's grown quite successfully. And in, um, hold on. And you can see obviously like most, most of the participation that comes through the Anati program is obviously majority Western Cape still, because most of the South African participation is still Western Cape, but it's starting to grow in the other provinces and it's also starting to grow in our neighboring countries. So that's, that's a really positive like uptick. And the ops team, based on their kind of like concept that we're creating a ghetto, asked me to um, give a breakdown of the Anati participants and how they engage in Africa Burn. And so based on the information that I had in terms of people who were part of creative crews and had registered projects, I was able to give everyone an overview and to note that actually the majority of people are people who are involved um, with projects that have creative grants, are involved with a combination of creative grant and theme camps, and are actually doing a whole lot of stuff at Africa Burn. And there's a, a bunch of people who are creative contributors who aren't part of registered projects, but they come and share their art and give their gift in that way. And then just to say things were really, really ramping up and for 2020 and with Cindy on board and also Josie on board and Gabby, who is an African-American volunteer who has since returned to the States. But she was living in Swaziland at the time. We, would we were really kind of pushing to actually allocate all of our tickets. And by the time we had canceled, we had actually maxed out our tickets and our grants. And Cindy had been doing work in Joburg, mobilizing communities and holding volunteer days and planning for the chiller stage that we were gonna do. And also incubation programs were happening in Cape Town. And we had gotten, for example, funding from the city of Cape Town, which meant that we were able to pay people some data money. We were able to give them transport to get to the junction to do different activities that were going on there. And I mean, Thomas, who is on the call tonight, he did a lighting workshop and we were managing to invite quite a few of the participants who were gonna be coming through the Anati program to those workshops. So yeah, so that's that. And then to say what we've also done is we've continued that into um, other spaces. So like decompression, we've done a radically discounted ticket for decompression. We've looked at finding funding to make sure that people can get transport there and get home safely at night. So we are really looking at different ways that we can break down those barriers and we can make it accessible, but absolutely it doesn't make it completely open and there always will be certain barriers because the main event is remains at a distance from kind of like your city centers, et cetera. Thank you, Cindy. Awesome, all right. Thank you so much, Lars. I love that presentation. Uh, that, that's like my favorite presentation ever. Um, Okay, um, I'll take, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions to the audience and I can see that Thomas uh, has something to say about that. Um, do you guys feel that the information around these programs like the Anati program, how we go into our incubation program, um, how we actually were talking to artists and finding out, I know myself and Issa, what we were doing at the back end as people were registering uh, their projects or programs, the things they wanted to do. We're, we were looking at who is interested in, uh, some people do a call out. Uh, we, need, we need carpenters, we need 
uh, technicians that can help with lighting. We need like, you know, that people were literally doing volunteer call outs and artist call outs. And what was so incredible was now we could take that info, we could get the information of the Nazi ticket holders that were coming through. Okay. The, the Nazi ticket holders that were coming through. And we could literally patch them into and say, okay, cool, here's a volunteer, here's a carpenter for from, from Alex, and he's looking to from Alexander Township and he's looking to, to do something. Um, oh, here's a, a, a Zulu dancer who'd love to, when you're burning your art piece, do a traditional maiden Zulu dance. Oh, um, and so that's the kind of stuff that we were doing. And and, and pre, even um pre our previous burn, we we had started to do that. Um, with artists from OCC and then plugging, like literally getting them onto the spirit train, getting them on uh, onto the stage, and 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 so that growing that the presence of the artists that we've gotten from uh, our uh, our program. So, do you feel that the information around these programs is adequately communicated? The, um, do you guys, any of the audience, want to pose that question or um, to answer the question? Thomas, you have something to say? Yeah, because uh, I want to add something before. Um, it starts with a little story of our driver for the lighthouse, uh, because we rented one of these big safari trucks. And at some point, we realized that that driver will stay the whole week at the burn. And we didn't know about it. We thought he's going back, and then he comes, you know, fetching us. And so he was like one week there sitting kind of apart and for sure we started to include him and say hey come on eat with us like hey tell 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 your story whatever and we found out he's from Zimbabwe and he has two kids and on Saturday we had him actually on that point that all our girls could dress him perfectly up for a wedding we had and he looked so amazing and he loved it so much and we loved him so much and so we went there all white and we didn't know about these projects. You know, if someone would reach out to us and say like, hey guys, you're coming over like 40 people, you want to include some people, you know, from like the townships or, you know, whatever, we would definitely take them in and we will definitely get them like the gig of their lives or whatever, because it's just cool. But um, I feel like people who go to the burn internationally, they are aware of the privilege, but they are not aware of the scale of the privilege we have. It's not just a hundred bucks, like how much it is an issue to get to the burn. I'm sure we would even spend like $500 of our budgets for buying tickets for some people. For sure we would do that if we would know that they really, really can't afford and they really want to be part of us. And nobody was reaching out to us actually to tell us that how strong we are in like changing things, how much power we have with the cash, how easy we can actually raise money to have like a big change in Africa. And I think we just didn't know about that. I, I learned later uh, and I know more things like local now. And I think the awareness isn't isn't there. And I think it's, it, it's for sure cool to make like a, a nice post on Facebook and the newsletter and so on. But when actually people come by, I think there should be more like an extra mail or like really engage people to have their meetings when they're not just talking about like what kind of artwork they're building and how to organize a camp. That they actually say like, hey guys, we're going to South Africa. So like, what's the issue? What can we do? Like what will make our experience better and what will make it's like a life-changing experience, like an everyday life-changing experience for locals there. And we didn't use that chance. We thought about maybe how we spend the money and that we don't feed big corporates and stuff. But we didn't realize that we could, we were mainly white. That's not the issue here, but we could say like, hey, let's, let's add some people who would never be here. Yeah, and um, nobody, was bringing that on our table when we had our meetings and simply because we didn't thought about. Yeah, so I think okay. that would be something that could be cool in the future. Done for the future, yeah. There's like a routine where, where, where it's like engaging people to include locals they would never include by default. Yeah, 
Thanks so much, Thomas. Does anybody want to add anything to, to that? All right, so then I'm going to our final question. Oh, thanks, Monique. Yes, Monique, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's actually one of the, um, just to speak to what Thomas is saying, it's one of the things that we've kind of been working out whether because once people become aware of the abilities and the program and the actual challenge by the organization to consider that, um, they do start doing it and snowballing it. Um, but one of the things is that, so we do that specifically with our creative crews. So that's all the theme camp people and all the artwork people. And we go, we have, we have one mail that goes out saying, you know, can't be passive about inclusivity. We have programs to support. It's not only for us to do, it's also for you to do, blah, blah. But the key problem is that we own, those emails only go to the camp lead and, and we're trying to work out how it should go to everybody in the team so that someone picks it up. Um, but one of the thoughts that we've had um, is to, so, so when, when people are doing creative crews, they have to write who the team lead is, who the communicator is, who the leave no trace representative is, blah, 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 who their safety officer is. And I think what we were discussing just before we shut down um, is actually allocating an inclusivity lead as well um, within your creative collective, just to kind of try and accelerate that aspect just so that someone's taking responsibility for it. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much, Monique. So our final question to you guys, um, what, so, and I think I got I got that from what to what to what everybody had to say. Um, but what are the real world limitations um, in terms of access, access? And then and how can we do better? How can we, you know? I, I yes. got I got it now that you guys are saying that um, we can provide more information. This is our final questions. We have ten minutes left over, so I'll give it. Five, I'll give this five minutes. Then I'll read some comments. Yes, Monique? I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't have an answer to that necessarily, but very often asking the right question is, leads you to the right answer. So that's a good question. But um, one, one thing that's, that, that I feel I would love us to be able to move beyond the narrative of inclusivity being only in the realm of people who are financially challenged. Yeah. Obviously in the South African context, as Ralph was saying, you know, the wealth gap is very much a racial gap, um, but that it's not only that, you know, there are other kind of things that we can do. I don't know what they are, but we need to brainstorm on them and work them out. Okay, thank you so much, um, everybody. I'm going to read some of the comments that have come uh, up from people. Um, okay, and then I'll hand over to Kyla quickly. Or oh, Kyla said that's a good idea. Incentivizing action around inclusivity. Um, yeah, I think Alex Noble was saying volunteers need to enjoy the burn. They mustn't be overworked. Um, Okay, yeah, and you know, the people are commending. I think you guys can see all the other, all the comments, most of them, because they've gone out to everybody. Um, so I'll just actually go straight to Kyla. What did you want to say? Uh, shortly, please. Uh, three minutes and then Roger. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, um, oh, I got a blank. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like this idea of, of it. Um, Oh, that's what I'm saying. In if I learned one thing in the pandemic, it's this notion of uh, solidarity, not charity, which was really quite revolutionary for me. And just listening to Lerato speak about um, this idea that Africa Burn already feels like home, you know. But but the, the, I think we need to get rid of this sense of like um, let's uh, let's bring them in or let's, you know, do some people a favor by letting them have an, a taste of this or, and more about going Africa burn is also these things. Um, it's also like your grandmother's fire in Mpumalanga. And it's so, so like more cultural references yeah. that are relevant to, to more of South Africa. 
um, uh, that's the kind of inclusivity I, I'm interested in. Not like, uh, um, oh, come, I'll, I'll pay for you to have a good time in the, the desert because shame. You know, it's not that. It's like, it's like, what, what, what do you bring from what your your culture, your values that can add to my culture, my values, which are which feel to me like the burn is my culture, my values. Um, but it's not only me; it's the richness of that. And secondly, I wanted to just say that that I love this idea. It's snowballing. It really is. Like looking at Lorraine's graphs. Um, I know certainly our application applications to the Anati program has been, yeah, have grown exponentially over the years since it was introduced. So I think it is very much around uh, tapping into the each one teach one thing. Sure. Do you want to have a final say before we? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, this, what's happening here is necessary. And I'm glad that I was, you know, part of it because we, we're going to need more. We're all different as human beings and, but we can still, you know, come together and make things happen. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Roger, do you have something to say? You're on mute, Raj. Thank you, Cindy, so much for hosting this and where you have been so well prepared and really focusing the question. Just very quickly, the one thing that we have discussed, but keeps coming back to me, I think would be such a fertile way to move this forward, especially for international projects or larger projects, is to have a sort of three-way exchange that happens between the educational space, if it's schools, educational institutions, colleges, um, what happens at the burn and what can happen in public spaces, in the city, in townships, in environments. So if people are coming out or if they're coming from other parts of the country and they have a huge project, if one can, if one can tack onto that, that there's an educational component that feeds into schools, that there's you know something that happens in the public space so that it has that kind of knock-on effect. I think that I think that could really help um, extend the kind of work that we are trying to do. Thank you so much. Um, Mali, 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 Lila, Mali, Malo, Mali, Lila, Mo. Oh my God, his name, Mali, Lima, Lo. We all call him Mali or Malo. Okay, so Malo in his interview had, had spoken about that. He's also one of our new NEDs that have come on board. Um, and Mali had said something in there as well, definitely. He's like, it's, it, it, you know, taking it from, from, the, from the desert to, 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 to the township, to schools, to to crashes, like have like literally, in, you know, taking that transformative experience to 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 these small groups in this three-way exchange. So I 100% agree with you, um, and and I'm just going to just leave, uh, leave it open for 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 us to just to, just to let you know that our next installment is about incubating the arts. So we're doing deeper into the developmental cycle, talking about um, the, the, now we're talking about the funding um, as well that's coming through, talking about actual nitty gritty programs as well. On the 24th of March is our next installment. Um, but I see that Mons has something to say quickly. No, I think her hand's just left. Oh, is your hand no, still actually, left? No, 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 I actually want to do to what Roger was saying, but it, but then it, it felt like irrelevant. But I just did, did want to say that uh, Streetopia, for example, has been a very fertile ground for pulling people in, yeah. Um, because the space is far more accessible, yeah. Um, and you know, and then the Joburg Streetopia as well. So it, it'll be a lovely thing to be able to do that again. And actually, just before we shut down, we were planning a Streetopia in Langa. Um, yes, yeah. I'm doing it. I think I spoke in, about that. Yes. Yeah, so so more more of that kind of stuff. Just kind of keep contemplating that. The Black Canvas Express was a very fertile ground. You know, all these all these kind of projects that we've been doing are they're finally getting traction. And, and that was, for me was a big disappointment as well about cancelling. Was like shit, man. It really felt like we were going to get to not critical mass, but seeing proper like actual results because we've been clawing at it. For, for ages and then pushing resources at it, like like for example, getting Lorraine in, um, getting Cindy in, you know, like really paying attention to it and, and literally just putting resources into that. 
Um, but, I, but, but it's very heartening to have seen it gain traction. And I just basically, we've just got to give it more petrol. Sorry, green petrol. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, um, veggie thank oil you. engines. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, um, um, in months for that. Uh, so much love. Thank you, guys. Um, kind of, I just wanted to give a voice quickly to Malili Malo because, you guys, it's an opportunity to meet him again. Um, he's one of our news uh, uh, NEDs as well, and he had some incredible ideas that I just noted. Hi, Mali. Hey, guys, how are you doing? We're good. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to this space. I mean, it's the very first time I attend this, and it's been just absolutely amazing just listening to everyone and all the ideas um, and all the things that we're thinking about. So it's been a very, very productive um, two hours for me. And um, I mean, I really think, um, like everyone was talking about, just inclusivity. It's, it's so important because when I went to my first Africa burn in, in, in 2017, you know, and I mean, I was like very, this very type A personality, didn't know much about art. And it was also, you know, the Fismos 4, I was very involved in that and, and tensions were still high at that time. And I think I was really just, you know, just struck by how you can have this community where everyone just feels um, like they're on the same level. Like you meet people from very different backgrounds, right? And you just shield it from all the, um, all, all the various narratives that are taking place outside and you're able to reach common ground with people you may not necessarily have interacted with um, in the same way on the outside. And I think that's one of the most powerful things about Africa Burn, you know, just, the, just the ability to bring people from different walks of life and just, just take us away from all our influences and just sit down and say, how can we actually have a positive impact in the world? I mean, that's extremely powerful. And I really hope that um, we can just do more of that, especially you know, with the various, um, you know, with the various issues that we're facing, like not only in South Africa and our own inequalities, but also just globally. You know, there's so much polarization, there's so much um, division going on, and I think we are one of those powerful tools that can really just um, bring a lot of positive impact in that. So I'm very excited, and I can't wait to come back to one of these sessions and definitely keep contributing. So thank you so much, Cindy, for organizing, and I'm very keen to meeting you guys in person one day. Thanks. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Rod, uh, Carla, do you want to say something and then Rolf, and then we've got to, I suppose, go. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I think my hand might be up still from okay. the. Sorry about that. No. Rolf, is your hand up? Um, no, I think it was the applause for Mali. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I just, I just liked what Mali was saying because I think it's also really important to remember. The points he was saying about Africa Burn being a special place um, mm. where people can meet each other, as he said, like uh, in some ways shielded from the dominant narratives of the world around us, which doesn't mean ignoring the real issues that cut through it, but also not to over bureaucratize the space around Africa Burn and also to remember what makes it a powerful space, you know. Um, yeah, so I agree with that. And thanks for the, uh, thanks for the session today. Thank you so much. And yeah, I'll see you guys all on the 24th of March, where we, we're going to have different speakers and um, we were talking about, as I said, incubating the arts and, and how Africa Burn has really gone into that and we can, we can draw from uh, more experience from that. I definitely learned so much. I know that we, we now know what we need to do, Mons, the, the practicality and the programs and, um, and we're pushing forward and then we know that we've got to uh, you know, obviously show you guys more of what we're doing in this in this space outside of just, as I said, just race, but access and inclusivity and incubating the arts and changing the world anew for all of us. Thank you so much, everybody, and good night. Bye. Thank you. I'm out. I appreciate you guys all coming. Thank you. Night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Dale. Cheers, Cindy. Thank you. Cheers, love. Nice. Thanks a lot. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye, Robert. Bye, bye, Miss Benzula. Bye, Sam. <laughs> Bye, Cindy. I'm just hanging around because 